Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, it's Wednesday, uh, November 11th, 2020, and you got in touch with the Miller Boys, your weekly talk show where we discuss all things impacting the African American community of the city of Fresno and the surrounding area. Um, and it's always our pleasure to to have this space um, and these discussions with you. As always, I'm joined by my lovely brother. Hi. Hi. Don't say hi. I need it. I need you to fill in because I'm trying to find how to share this. And hi. It's not. How are you? It yeah, it's you know Veterans Day today, and uh, you know, like we say, all things African American and the positive connection. So you can see my background. Um, I don't know anybody in that picture, but it's some African American uh, males um, that have served and given their cause for the country that Donald Trump just pooped all on, and uh, and so we st we're still appreciative that we can be in that space and in that place. And and to all of the veterans, we like to say uh, we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you know we. Um, uh, that, that, that we can give special thanks and grace to you for all that you have done for us and all you have done for the country. We appreciate it. We love you. Uh, those are the Aaron's, the uh, Aaron's, uh, the Harry's, the, the Isaiah's, the Tamia's, the, the, the everybody. I can't, I can't name everybody I know to the Terry Hebron's to the on and on and on. You did a whole bunch of them. I, I forgot about my boy Terry, although I did see his Green Mile uh, Facebook picture today. I don't know if you saw that or not. No, nah, but we just watched the Green Mile right now. It was on. <laughs> he, sent a, he sent a picture from uh, Thailand, um, you know, basically saying Happy Veterans Day. He looked like the Green Mile, as usual. Um, yes. Yeah. But, yeah, so, yeah, we had a – I sent out a post earlier today. We've got a bunch of people um, in the family that have served. Um, as you said, Daddy um, and Aaron, uh, Uncle George and Uncle, uh, and Uncle Hank both served in the Army. Uh, Uncle Andy served in the Navy. Uh, Grandpa, Grandpa Miller served in the Navy. Uncle, Uncle John. John. Yeah. Was that? Uncle John. Yeah, yeah, Uncle John, Grandma's brother, served in the Navy. They were at the end of World War II. I don't think they got into... I think they went in like in 44, 45, 46, something like that. So it was at the end of the World War II um, that they went in um, and served. Uh, remember Uncle Jake? Yes. Grandma, Grandma Lucy's brother. Uh, yes. His twin, Charlie, Jake and Charlie, both served in the military. Uh, we got the Burnses out in Tulsa on the Miller side. Um, I forget their names. There was two brothers out there that served in the Army. Uncle um, Jack Daniels, Uncle Jim Bean. <laughs> yeah, you're funny. <laughs> Uncle, uh, uh, Uncle uh, Austin, uh, uh, Austin Nichols. You know yeah. Austin Nichols? <laughs> yeah, he's in everybody's pocket. I had to get you out of my pocket. <laughs> and speaking of which, man, um, I'm going to get something for you. You like 100 proof whiskey, right? Right. 100 plus. 100 plus. Well, yeah. he, only pull up, he only pull up with two zeros. Who's so, this? Uncle uh, Nears? Uncle Nears, yeah. Have you had that before? I have. I haven't had 100 proof, but I have had uh, um, 18, whatever it is, yeah. 1788, 1887 or whatever it is. It's the regular one. I've had that. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a whiskey connoisseur. The whiskey goes good with everything. You can cook with whiskey. Put it in your barbecue yeah. sauce. And you, you, could, you, could cook, you could cook with whiskey and it never hit the pan. <laughs> yeah, you do all that. You're hilarious. Okay, so keeping in the theme, I got a bunch of stuff by the way tonight about the military. So keeping in the theme, I want to give a shout out to the is that Uncle Nares here? Fresno. I don't know if it's Fresno County or the city of Fresno Veteran Day Parade, which happened today. Um, for those of us who are here in the Central Valley, we may not know this. But the Fresno Parade is the oldest Veterans Day parade west of the Mississippi. A lot of people don't understand that, don't know that. And there was some uh, uh, conversation about not having it because of what's going on with COVID and stuff. But I'm glad they did have it. Um, I wasn't able to participate, but I'm glad that they did ultimately have it. 
And for those of you who have not been down there to that parade, that's about a five-hour parade of local uh, servicemen, with, um, local veterans from the different forces um, that goes on and does their parade. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. If you've never been down there, please, hopefully this time next year, COVID will um, be taken care of. So November 11th of 2021, you'll be able to go down. They usually start at the convention center parking lot and go down. Is that M Street, Gerald, that's in front of City Hall? Uh, Street, P Street. Whatever. P. P Street, okay. So they start at convention center, parking lot, and then they go down uh, P Street. Yeah, there you go, 1894. That's not the 100 proof, though, is it? No, no. it's only the 80 proof. Yeah, that's the one that that's the one that I have before. What you doing with that? You don't drink that stuff. You don't know what I do. Yeah, I do. I know a no, whole lot about you. No, you don't. Stepping up your game. You didn't got rid of the. Okay, so you know the story on that, right? Yes, I do. This is ninety three proof. Okay, so it's a little over. What? Well, so what have you heard about the story about Uncle Nearest? He's the he's the one the slave the slave that taught Jack Daniels how to make Jack Daniels. Exactly. And Jack Daniels basically stole the the recipe from Uncle Nearest. Somebody in his family did the history, found out, and they started making their own whiskey. So it is a it is a black owned uh whiskey. I don't know if it's the only or the first, uh, but it is a black owned whiskey company. And uh I have a bottle right here for for uh, uh, you know I, You ain't sharing? Yeah, I'm sharing. That bottle look kind of full. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I sip. I don't. <laughs> hey, I don't drink to get drunk. Yeah, that ain't okay. no fun in that. You better go get you some ripple. I think you're trying to lure me down. That's like a fishing lure. You're trying to lure me down there uh, where you are, huh? You, you said it got to be over a hundred proof. Well, you know, you do what you got to do. Uh, hey, Christmas is coming. I found I found a store that, that sell it pretty. Pretty regularly. Local? Uh, no. Yeah, I haven't been able to find a local. No. I, don't know. I ain't been really looking, but um, you can actually order that online. You can get uh, orders of that um, through the internet, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, yes, I want to make sure I want to make sure that I mentioned that shout out for the Veterans uh, Veterans Day Parade. As I said, I, I should have done more so I can tell you the dates and history, but I just know that it is recognized as the oldest Veterans Day Parade west of the Mississippi. And so shout out woo, to the city of Fresno um, and those people who are, are part of that. And so. and a special shout out to the Marines. Yesterday was their birthday. I worked with a couple of Marines. Uh, and then, I, you know, of course, we know a few. Uh, Sammy, you know, uh, happy birthday. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Dwight O'Neill, happy birthday. He's a Marine? Yes, he was. Yes, he, yes, he is. I can't say yes, he was. I got in trouble for that oh, long. Yeah, yeah, that's ago. true. Yeah, once a Marine, always a Marine. Um, yes, so, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I heard that today when people were talking about it also. Yeah, once a Marine, always a Marine. You're never a former Marine. Hey, so who, what, who, are the, who is the picture behind you? Um, it is a just a picture I found and pulled out off for tonight since we're talking about veterans. I don't know who that's they really are or where they are, but I appreciate their service. That's if I'm not mistaken, that's World War II. Um, they got the the crosses on there. I believe that is part of what was going on in World War II. So yeah, I got a but I went I did some research today. Um, just kind of some some firsts and some names and those different things for the different branches and stuff. And so um, and one of them in particular with the Army connects to the Central Valley. Are you familiar with that story? No. Okay, so I'll, get, I'll go to that one last. So in the Navy, um, we have, there is numerous, there's about a dozen ships that are named after African Americans. One of them, uh, most famously, is Dory Miller. No relation that we know of to us. But Dory Miller was um, during the, the, the Japanese invasion in, um, in Hawaii. He was a cook who, when everything was going haywire, wound up leaving the kitchen, went up on deck, and took one of the the, uh, the, the high-caliber gunships, uh, uh, guns, and shot down. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have heard that story. I didn't know that um, 
that's who it was. I didn't know his name was Dory Miller, though. Yeah, his name is Dory Miller. If he's a hero, then I'm sure he's related to me. <laughs> okay. And if he's related to you, that means he's related to me. So, But I don't that's, know. That's correct. Um, but it's Dory and, Miller. And if, he, if he wasn't before, he is now. Right. Shout and out, so, Dory. Uh, <laughs> one of the other people in there, um, and you guys may, I don't, I should have looked up what the movie was called. Um, uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. did a movie um, about the first black master diver. His name was Carl Brashear. Right. Do uh, you remember what the movie was called? No, I don't. Uh, anyway, Carl Brashear was the first master diver uh, in the movie. It talks about all the, the, the discrimination and all the odds he had going against him uh, to become a master diver. He went through all of it, took it off. And then after that, uh, during a training operation, he wound up having a severe injury on one of the boats and lost his leg. He had to have a leg amputated when it was crushed. And so I want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, Carl Brashear, who was the first African-American master diver uh, with the Navy, uh, with the Marines, um, doing a little, little, did a little research. The first African-American officer in the Marine Corps was a gentleman by the name of Frederick Clinton Branch. And he became an officer in 1942. So that was right in the middle, in the midst of what was going on with World War II. Um, and he was, um, as I said, I don't know what his whole pedigree was and where he served and those type of things. But Frederick Clinton Branch um, is recognized as the first officer in the Marine Corps in 1942. The Air Force... Everybody's heard about the Air Force. They just may not know that. Um, the Air Force, uh, remember, until 1940, I believe it was. No, actually, it was a lot later than that. Eisenhower. So maybe 48 is when the armed services were actually integrated. So before that, um, people had the, the army, armed forces were segregated. And so everybody's heard of the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, and I'll talk about them in a little bit. But with the Air Force, the first uh, people in the Air Force was there was an experiment that started at Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, Tuskegee, uh, Tuskegee University in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, with uh, training Air Force pilots. And there was over 100 pilots that was um, trained to do fighter, fighter missions and things, escorts that they did during World War II. But even a bigger part of that that people don't realize is all the support that went along with those planes, so all the mechanics, um, all of the cooks, all of the people that was involved in what was going on with the Tuskegee Airmen were all black because we were a segregated um, armed force at that time. And so there was estimated that it was upwards of 2,500 people who had received training um, and there in Tuskegee is part of that, that experiment out there. And some of the names that came out of that, the first officer was Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. I know there's been films about him. And then Daniel Chappie James was one of the first fighter pilots, not an escort guy, but an fi actual fighter pilot um, was part of the Tuskegee Airmen. But the Tuskegee Airmen were, was, uh, was noted during World War II for escorting bombers. So, right. And uh, as um, one of the chaperones of Leadership West Fresno, we took uh, two or three trips down to Tuskegee, which is in Alabama, which uh, has a, an air museum on the campus. And um, they have, I believe it's over a thousand acres. And there's a, there was an airstrip and an airfield out in the back of Correct. Tuskegee where they did all the training in Tuskegee uh alabama so um yeah it you know if, if people would get out get out get out of black folks way we would african americans and africans in the diaspora we would be able to save the world but you know hey that ain't that ain't, so, that ain't in some people's uh agenda so there was there is there is movies and all the type of things about the tuskegee airmen and what they did um and what they're noted for was, like I said, escort planes. And so as the U.S. was bombing Hitler and what was going on with the Germans in different places, these big old bombers couldn't defend themselves. 
You know, they big old huge planes that got the, all these bombs and stuff in them, but they didn't have the ability to fight stuff. And so the Tuskegee Airmen would fly escorts to get these bombers in um, into wherever they were going into Europe or Italy, um, Italy or Germany or wherever it was they were going to bomb, and they never lost a bomber. The whole time that they were fighting in the air, they never lost a bomber. And the white bomber pilots would request that they get escorted from wherever they were flying from into the battlefield by the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, that, that was the type of reputation that they had. And, and so, how did they know that the, they were being escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen? The red tails. They had the, the red uh, tails. The, the, the back fin of the plane was painted red. And so that's how they knew um, that they were being escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen is because of the red tails. And that, I think that's the, the name of the, one of the movies, right? The latest yes. one was called Red yes. Tails. Yeah. And so one of the things with, with the Tuskegee Airmen and the red tails is that after World War II, Calm down. They had a bunch of pilots that they had trained, but the war stopped. So a lot of the trainings, I want to say this training started, the experiment started in 1940, but they were not sent into the battlefield until 1943. And then the war was over in 44, 45. So there was a, only like a year, year and a half where the Tuskegee Airmen was actually escorting these bombers. So they had all these, these, these pilots and different people who can deal in the Air Force, you know, mechanics, that kind of stuff. They didn't know what to do with them. A lot of them wound up in Sacramento. Uh, there used to be a huge uh, Red Tails Tuskegee Airmen chapter um, of retirees that was there. And in, 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 uh, I don't know if it was Mather or one of those Air Force bases that are there in the Sacramento area is where a lot of the, the uh, um, a few of the Tuskegee Airmen retired from. And so they were there in the Sacramento area. And they just lost maybe like in the last five years or so, the last living um, Tuskegee Airman who was involved in training and the battle and stuff, he just passed away. Um, well, yeah, you think about it. If he was uh, 18, probably older, because a lot of them actually had college degrees. Correct. Um, so you figure if he was 20 years old in 1945, 40, 40 to 45, uh, that would put him right at 100 years old. So, you know, I, it's time for some folks to be getting on out of here. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, um, I, can, I can see that. And there probably ain't too many of them left unless they were flying when they were five years old. I don't think that any of – I may be wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, I don't believe that there are any living Tuskegee Airmen who was actually involved in the battlefield. The ones that are that are alive now were the ones that were getting trained in 44, 45, when the war ended, and then they went to different places. But they weren't actually involved in the World War II um, the battle, campaign. the campaign, yeah. They weren't involved in that. They still called themselves Tuskegee Airmen because they came through the training that happened there at Tuskegee University, but they didn't actually go into Europe um, to participate in what was going on over there. So, but yeah, if I'm not mistaken, Chappie James, if I'm not mistaken, was one of the gentlemen who went, who, when he passed, he was in Fairfield, not Fairfield, he was in uh, uh, Yuba City, um, mm. up in, up, up there just north of, uh, north of Sacramento. So it was one of these guys, I don't remember if it was, if it was Davis or James, but one of them, it, it was one of the two of them, when they passed away, they were up there in the Sacramento area. And beautiful so have, country up there. What's that? There's beautiful country up there. Well, that, I mean, we have that like, California has some connections, connections yeah. to what goes on with the Tuskegee Airmen. But here is the real connection to the Central Valley with the armed forces. It has to do with the Army. Okay? So, um, everybody has probably heard of the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, and a lot of people um, may not know the details of the P Buffalo Soldiers. Buffalo Soldiers, Soldiers was an all all black regiment. I think there was. I think they said there was six of them that was put together around the time of the Civil War. So this would have been 1868 or whatever it was, 66, 68. So they were formed at that time, but they were part of the army 
towards the end of the Civil War, and they were sent to the Western Front. So they were in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, places like that, which was the Western Front. So they were sent out there. That's how they got the name Buffalo Soldiers. They got that from the Native Americans, the Sitting Bulls, um, I don't know who are some of the other people, that the, the, the Indian chiefs then, they said that the people that they fought against, these black soldiers they fought against, were as tough as buffaloes. And they had hair like buffalo. So our Afros reminded the Native Americans of the Afro that's on a buffalo. Have you ever seen a buffalo? And so that's how they got the name of Buffalo Soldiers, is from the Native Americans in the fiercest, the fierceness of them fighting on the Western Front. And so um, when the Civil War was over, there was really no more fighting for the army to do. And so they changed and, and, and put a lot of the army people into doing um, surveillance, not surveillance, um, um, I forget what, I, I can't think of what the term is, but where you're going out doing land, you're figuring out. Surveying. Surveying. There you go. Thank you. So a lot of the, the black army people at the end of the Civil War started doing surveying. And so they were very, 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 very influential in the establishment of the national parks. Yep. There were some that were involved with, with um, Teddy Roosevelt when they were started putting together Yellowstone and what was going on with that. But most significantly, these Yosemite and Sequoia National Forest, so Yosemite National Park and Sequoia National Forest, which is, you know, 50 miles from where we are right now, was surveyed and, land, and, and plotted out by Buffalo soldiers under the leadership of a, of a, he was a colonel at that time, his name was Charles Young. So... If you go, when you go to Yosemite, there are different um, acknowledgments of Colonel Young um, and the leadership that he gave um, with the plotting out of, of Yosemite in particular, but they were the ones who found uh, the large sequoias, Grant's Tomb, not Grant's Tomb, Grant's Grove, tree. Yeah. the big tree and the grove of those trees. It was the Buffalo Soldiers under um, Charles Young that found those groves and was, or the ones who surveyed it and acknowledged and named um, those things that were up there. And so there is a direct connection to the Central Valley, in particular in Fresno and Madera County, and actually in Tulare County with the Buffalo Soldiers under the leadership and guidance of, of Colonel Charles Young. Um, and significantly, he was born on March 12, 1864. So he, uh, he shares a birthday with our mother, uh, which I thought was kind of, uh, was interesting. He was a first, by the way, he was also, he was the first black colonel in, uh, in the army. So the other thing that goes on with the army, which is a little bit less um, shared, and I didn't even think about this until just right now, is Colonel Allensworth, the, the first black all black settlement in the state of California, which is down by Tipton, which is about 45 miles south of us, down in between Tipton and around Corcoran. Uh, that was also um, plotted out, surveyed, um, was put together by a gentleman who came out of, I don't know if he was a Buffalo soldier or not, but I do know he was an army officer. Um, Colonel Allensworth was the one who created that settlement that's down there. So we have huge influence, two huge influences here in the Central Valley uh, from African-American colonels who were part of the Army Regiment. Yes, sir. So, interesting. I just thought that that would be interesting to share and talk about as, we, as we're talking about our veterans um, and the connection to, between African-Americans and the Central Valley. And there may even be more. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep digging. Oh, well, there, there, there are more. There, there's um, the Richmond shipyards, um, where they built the big ships uh, in the bay up there in Richmond, uh -huh. and uh, there was a, a large explosion, and a lot of people came um, passed in that explosion, um, and that set some standards for handling uh, ammunitions and munitions in the in the uh, um, in the navy. 
Um, a lot of African Americans moved out. I was uh, listening to a, I don't know if it was a podcast or something, where they were talking about how the, I think it was about the um, the, the land development and how African Americans came oh, yeah. to the Bay Area and how uh, Richmond was a very segregated yeah. um, uh, society uh, up there and how they couldn't live in the city. They had to live in what would be uh, out in the in Contra Costa County in the, in the shacks and shanties. Well, yeah, that public, was... Uh, it was public housing. They put together, but basically yes. projects. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and it, was a, it was... They could only live in some and they couldn't live in others right. and... Right. Yeah. So yeah. No, there we have a really strong, strong. You know, I'm not a big Southern California person, so I can't really tell you about about them, what's going on down there. But yeah, I, I do remember hearing that story about. Uh, and there was a, the the oldest African American um, park ranger. I don't know if it was a state park or a federal park, whichever that is. That's where she was working, um, giving tour guides. So it might, if you are in the um, looking for a day trip, of course not now in COVID, but um, that might be something that you could plan up also to learn a little more uh, African American history about Where was uh, this? California in Richmond. Where was this? Uh, where? Yeah, in Richmond, Richmond, California, in the uh, the Navy shipyard that's back there. They have a museum. Um, uh, and uh, the the uh, the oldest park ranger, and like I said, I don't know if it's federal or state. Um, and I think she was in her nineties, so hopefully she's still around. Um, and there's people that can tell you about it. But it would be worth a day trip to go up there and get some some African American history about the Richmond shipyards. Yeah, there was a tour guide that was. I think he just retired though, uh, up in Yosemite, African American who could give you all the history of what was going on with the Buffalo soldiers mm -hmm. and how they uh, they surveyed out um, uh, the Yosemite Park and all those type of things up there. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think he retired just recently. We used to take, um, when we took those kids, that leadership conference, we used to go up to Merced every year with the middle school kids. They would take a day yeah. trip up to Yosemite, and he would take as a park ranger, a federal, he was a federal park ranger. Mm -hmm. um, a federal park ranger and was a brother that was up there that, that would take people around. But like I said, I think he retired in the last couple of years. So, yeah, and, man, if, and if people um, want to get an opportunity, you know, you can always go down to, um, oh, well, not right now, but Colonel Allensworth also down there with, with their settlement, like I said, down there by Corcoran, they do um, an event in February. They do something for Juneteenth. They do a Pioneers event that talks about their history. That's usually done in May. And then they have a Juneteenth celebration um, down there as well. And I don't know what the schedule is for, for 2021, um, but it's an opportunity to go down there and kind of take a look at um, the African-American, the, the first all-black um, settlement in the state of California is less than 60 miles south of, of Fresno. So. And, you, and you can learn how they was they uh, got their water contaminated and cut off by stopped y'all from being prosperous and uh, yeah you can learn the, the treacheries of uh, other cultures. <clears throat> yeah, so those are those are the things that I want to. I mean, as far as um, you know, oh, I take that back. One more person, one more name that everybody should know: um, Crispus Attucks. Okay, uh, is recognized as the first casualty of the American Revolution. Um, he was of African and Native American descent, and he was uh, killed at the uh, Boston uh, Boston Tea Party, Boston Massacre. And have you ever heard the story about the Boston Massacre, uh, the Boston Tea Party? Yeah, you discussed that with me one time. That it's not actually as it um, has been told in Correct. the history books. It is nothing like, and I, I encourage people to, 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 uh, to take a look at Malcolm Gladwell. It was a, a, a podcast that Malcolm Gladwell put together that talked about uh, revisionist history, basically how you look at history, um, the way that history has been told to us, and you actually look at the details of history, and then you kind of get a revised version of it. 
But the Boston Tea Party was about smuggling. Had nothing to do with the revolution. Had to do with smugglers. And the smugglers at that time, it was, um, they didn't want to pay taxes. And so they wound up putting all the tea uh, from the legitimate sources into the harbor so the, 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 the smugglers and the, the tea bandits can keep up their um, nefarious businesses. So anyway, Christmas Addicts was, was killed as part of what went on with what's called the Boston Massacre. Um, not the Tea Party, but the Boston Massacre. He was one of the first casualties, and he was a black um, of African and Native American descent. And I didn't, I didn't write the year down, but it would have been 17... 1776, 17, ain't it? Ain't that when it was uh, the war broke out and, and they got to yeah, fighting but, and doing their thing? But it would have been... I think it might have been before that when he got killed. Anyway, I, I should have wrote the date down, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, so 1776 or around that particular time is when um, Christmas Addicts lost his life um, as well. And so he um, he needs to be acknowledged today as well. So um, I encourage everybody to go back and take a look um, at, at the contributions that, that African Americans and people of the African diaspora has made um, to military service. Um, and, and it is rich and lengthy, uh, and like I said, and it uh, was a situation where until 1948, 52, somewhere in there, wherever Eisenhower was, Eisenhower was the first president to desegregate the military. Um, and up until that time, um, blacks and Native Americans could serve in the military, but they had to serve in segregated uh, ranks and so they lived in black barracks. They lived in all black. They were in all black regiments, um, fighting. And you know they're in. in it's a ski airman. I believe it was a, the ski airman movie. They're in Italy, and uh, some of the ski airmen are officers. And Americans went to Italy, and they basically commandeered certain areas where only officers could go into a particular club or, or pub or whatever. And so the African-Americans of who were officers wanted to go in the pub, they were officers, and they were met with resistance um, until they found out who they were. When they found out they were the Red Tails and that they had escorted these guys to safety when they were dropping their bombs um, in Europe, um, then all of a sudden the, the, the whole mood changed uh, from some of the guys um, that were there, some of the servicemen that were there in Italy. Um, I remember some stories and watching some documentaries about what was happening in Italy in particular. So it's been a long, hard road. Um, I don't know what the percentage, do you know what the percentage of African Americans are in the military? I do not. Let me see if I can find it real quick. One, 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 one fun fact, though, is that um, African Americans can only serve in the military uh, based on an executive order, which was uh, bantered about that, that uh, Trump might repeal that order just to be a crotch rocket, and uh, he can kick the, kick all the African Americans out of the out of the military if he repeals that executive order. So that, say that again. There's an, there's somebody who did an executive must have been Eisenhower then. Uh, and, and 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 Eisenhower. Uh, and I believe that it was, and I and I know for a fact because I was reading an article about Eisenhower. His mom was a mulatto, so he right. was a, he was a black person, and he signed the executive order stating that um, African Americans could serve in the military and the armed forces. So that we're riding on the on the back. It's not a constitutional amendment. It is an executive order that could be repealed. Uh, and and bye bye military for uh, African Americans. I don't think it will happen, but who knows what the clown and the and the White House, the current clown in the White House, will do? Um, that's just, <laughs> that's just a fact that we're gonna slide in there for your public okay, knowledge. Check this out. I'm looking at a website right now. It's called Statistica. So I don't know if it's you know I don't Actually, know I don't know nothing about it. I just kind of punch it up. So in night in in 2018 by race. In the military, 29.22% of the women that were in the military were black. 
it is second only to white females that are in the military. 53.76. Black men were 16.82%. This is enlisted. Active duty enlisted, which was third behind 69, basically 70% white, 17.32% Hispanic, and then 16.82 black. So black women are the second largest ethnic and gender population in the military. Very interesting. That is incredible. So, uh, I mean... And they're trying to escape, you know, poverty coming out of the South, I'm sure, where there are no jobs, there are no issues. They go into the military. Uh, one of the guys that I work with, he was uh, sharing a story with me about how he came out of Louisiana with his cousin and, and um, went into the Marines and uh, ended up in California. So, so let me, so think about this. The African American, there are more African American, there are more female African Americans. So there's 13% more 12% more African American females than there are males in military. The only other thing that compares to that is Hispanic, which is female is 21% uh, and men are 17%. That's 13% difference, in more women than men in the African American, and 3% more in the Hispanic community. That's incredible. I did not realize that. Why is that incredible? Because of the, the discrepancy and that, that, that there's that many black women, African-American women that are going into the military. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised knowing what I know about education and 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 what what was happening with African American men, um, some of the factors that would probably prevent them from being able to go into the military, criminal justice um, interactions, not graduating from high school, uh, you know, uh, uh, death, uh, being killed in homicides, and and whatever you know, car jail, accidents. being being incarcerated, locked up for no good reason. Wow, I need to take a look at this. I'm gonna, uh, this is something I'm gonna yeah. look at. Like I said, this was just the first website that I grabbed, Statistica, and I've never heard of them, so I don't know anything about what their data says. Okay. okay. And like I said, that was as of 2018. Okay, so here's Pew. Let me see. Uh, Yes. They're saying overall the women are increasing across the board in the military. Yeah, I have to I have to take a look at this more deeply. But Pew the Pew has numbers on it as well. And that they're they're a very reputable um research entity. But that's interesting to me, man. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, what else is on your topic? Um, your mayor elect has corona. That's that's significant. Not because he has has corona, but how he got it. You heard the story yeah. about how he got it, right? Uh, no, well, last week when I was here, Brandau was uh, talking about how he had it. They got and it all at the same event. Mask up and won't stop going to parties. So hey, yeah. you know, Corona is yeah. non-discriminatory. They had a super spreader. The, they, the conservatives, had a super spreader election watch party that Brand I was at, Dyer was at, and Darius Asimi, local developer, deep pocket developer, was all at, and they all have coronavirus now. So. 
that is all connected through their uh, through the county, Fresno County um, what do you call it? contact tracers or whatever the hell it is called. Um, they they've confirmed that that the three of them have the virus and that they were all at the same uh, election watch party event. So that's significant because that's the conservative mindset. Look what's going on on a national level. They're tracing uh, um, shit. What are their names? Damn, I can't even think of their names. But there's a group with um, of Trump's people that all have coronavirus. His, his White House staff. Yeah, I can't think of the names, though. Um, anyway, yeah, their names, they're, the individual people's names? Yeah, the individual people's names. But there, there's numerous staff members that have been... Um, Shoot, ben, ben Carson. Uh, the um, This is more recent. There's a recent outbreak... And they're 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 doing tracing and they're finding out that these rallies, these last minute presidential rallies that he had, those cities that he went to, are having spikes in COVID um, two two weeks after he was there. Um, so he, he he don't give a damn about nobody, man, but except for his damn self. So, well, yeah, uh, welcome to the party. He, he he's a. Uh... You know, everything that I've heard, um, news talk in different places are talking about how he's now won't concede because he's trying to make all the money he can so that he can pay his bills off because, you know, he ain't got no money to begin with. So, you know, he's, he, he's putting the he's putting the country in harm's way because of his selfish conservative uh, values and. I asked a, a person last night, we got into a conversation, and I asked, he's a Trump supporter, and I, and I asked him, I said, well, I don't know, I'm not trying to get into a debate with you, an argument or anything, but do you really honestly believe, two questions, one, that Trump has any chance of winning, and, and two, um, that Trump is going to lead, uh, would lead the country in the right path? I said, you know, I just need to, to, for you to answer those two questions. Um, the first one uh, he answered was that he honestly believes that there was corruption and in, in, in voter fraud and that Trump uh, is going to win his lawsuits and, and he was going to make it stay in the White House. Um, then he, he turned around and said that if, if Trump, uh, if, if he loses, then, which he's already lost, but this is the mindset of the the conservative folks if he loses then he'll just have to come back and run again and win the presidency back and put the and put the after the hole that he has dug um it's gonna be really really hard for the next person to fix that hole i don't know if it's enough dirt sod or soil to put in the hole that, that donald trump is gonna leave in his wake but but they but but the those that side of the aisle they really really believe in this lying conniving thief of a of a, of a person. I can guarantee you that he will not be eligible to run for office because he will be a felon. There's no doubt in my mind. In the next four years, he he will be convicted of a felony. Which then will make him ineligible to run in twenty twenty four. So interesting. But I've I've heard that same information. Um, the thing that supposedly the conservatives are trying to do now is delegitimize individual state elections so they cannot certify in time. They cannot certify that their elections these are the numbers in time uh, for the Electoral College. That's what's going to happen in Georgia. And Georgia will not be able to certify in time because there's no way in hell they're going to be able to count do a hand recount of all those ballots in time. I think their deadline, if I'm not mistaken, their deadline is November the 20th. That's nine days from now. That's supposed to count how many ever million hand count, how many ever million ballots they got. Well, so is, he, is, is he still... Is the count 
still within the margin of error that, that they need for the recount? Yeah, 0. 0.5. It's, it, it's within the margins. Um, so that part of it is going to be legitimate. The part of it is going to be illegitimate is they don't, they're not going to be able to hand count that information by the deadline. They got nine days to can recount all those ballots. And so what they're going to say is we cannot, as a state, uh, the state of Georgia cannot certify the numbers that they have as being accurate. So when that happens, then it goes to their, their state legislature to direct how they're going to cast their electoral ballots. They're hoping that shit happens with Pennsylvania, but it's not going to happen. Pennsylvania's lead is too big. Uh, it's either Michigan. I think it's Michigan. They're going to try to do the same thing with Michigan, but the Michigan lead is too big. Nevada. Nevada, he cannot do – no, I'm sorry, not Nevada. Arizona, he can't do a recount unless it's within some small, small, small number that Biden is way out, outside of. Um so they got to flip, and not it's not just one state they have to, to turn, like with uh, Bush and Gore in 2000. They got to flip three states in order for um, the election not to be certified. And they're not going to be able to do that. They're going to try, but they're not going to be able to do that. Why are you eating? <laughs> My stomach is growling. You can't hear me. Yeah, okay. Okay. You just see my lips going. Oh, I can, oh, I can hear you smacking. Mm. Anyway, so, so we're talking about politics. One of the things I want to talk about uh, or just mention is the significant accomplishments that we made as African Americans here in the Central Valley. Um, right now, minus uh, Kern County, which I have not been able to get their information, but um, Tulare, Kings, Fresno, Madera, Merced, Status Loss, and San Joaquin counties, we have, tw right now, unofficially, we have 20 African Americans that have been elected to um, either as trustees for educational entities or to city councils, and we have one county supervisor um, that was elected. So locally, here in Fresno County, Two first, Sean Brooks will be the first African American female on Central Unified School District Board. Yolanda Moore will be the first African American ever in Clovis Unified Board. Um, Katina Austin, friend of mine out in Dos Palos, will be the first African American female on Dos Palos's Dos Palos uh, Los or Los, or whatever the hell it is, Orlando or whatever the hell it is, um, school board. Um, Dr. Gail Crooms will not be the first, but she's going to be, she got elected to, in Kings County, to Lemoore Elementary School District. Dr. Crystal Jackson is the first African-American elected to the West Hills Community College District in Kings County. Um, Anita Evans is the first African-American female ever to be elected to the Madera City Council. Um, Rhodesia Yansom, Rhodesia Ransom, will be the first county African-American county supervisor, I think, in the entire valley. She just got elected in San Joaquin, uh, uh, San Joaquin County, which is Tracy Stockton. But if I'm not mistaken, she is the first African-American county supervisor elected in all counties in Central Valley. I have to, I have to check that. I know, I know she's the first in San Joaquin, first uh, female as well as African-American. And then Nancy Young was elected um, as the first African-American um, mayor of the city of Tracy. Uh, she's been on the city council up there, but she just got elected as mayor to the city council. I mean, to the um, mayor for the city. Um, also significantly, um, as you we talk about conservative and progressive Democrat, red versus blue in the central in the Central Valley, there are two. Blue counties, Fresno County and Merced County, actually were blue. They voted um, in favor of Biden and Harris, um, as well as they um, elected some other countywide officers um, that are also in the Democratic side. So those two counties are also blue um, going forward. The state of California, significantly blue. Um, in the presidential election, we grew 
In 2016, we were at 61 percent of the people in California voted for Hillary Clinton. For Joe Biden, it's up to 65 percent. So we are actually becoming bluer on a national scale. Um, of course, you probably have heard that this is the largest, this is the largest, the most participated in election ever in the history. Uh, basically, 145, 150 million people um, voted in this election. Um, Joe Biden is at 76. But I'm going to ask you this question because I, I heard this last night. Um, mm -hmm. What was the catalyst behind that? Um, I think there was two catalysts behind that. I think that um, one is that the people on our side of the ledger want to change. They don't want to have Trump in office anymore. But on the other side of the ledger, the whole bunch of people wanted to keep him in office. And so I think that's the... Um, right. So, so, so he was the, ca the, the catalyst... Mm -hmm. For all of these, not all of them. I mean, there's, uh, I'm sure people voted for other reasons, but he was the main catalyst, uh, negative and positive, for the votes, the, the, the turnout of the votes. Agreed. Um, and, and that is, that is some uh, power in the universe to be able to draw that many people to either love you or to hate you, um, to pull you in or to push you out. Luckily, there are more people that were on the side of, of, of pushing the clown back in the clown car. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's, you know, yeah, that, that was interesting. I heard I heard it put that way last night. And I was like, wow, yeah, that's that's some some power. I, I agree with you. And the part that, that interests me about that is what is going to be the after effect when there is no clown to drive the pro and the con going forward are we going to regress back into our own uh, silos and not participate or, or are we going to continue um the trek of participating in, in elections as i'm talking about we as a people are we going to continue to participate are we going to are, are we not? as a people as an african-american nation within a nation or, or as an uh, as an american society both both are we African Americans going to continue to participate in the vote. Um, we as Americans as as, uh, as American citizens eligible to vote are we going to continue to participate? Um, so I'm interested to watch what's going to happen with the numbers to see how when they do the breakdowns, how the 18 to 24 year olds and the 24 to whatever it is 36 or 34 year olds that that younger group. I want, I'm really curious as to how, what their participation rate is. Because remember, they are the largest, the under 40s is the largest group of voters that we have in the United States now. So I'm real curious to see what the participation rates were with them versus what will happen with the, the, the baby boomers, who's the generation before us, um, who has always carried the vote going forward. It's going to be interesting to see what goes on with those numbers. Yeah, I think that uh, the you know the, the people that are over forty are going to be dying off, and uh, if Trump is seventy two, correct, he'll be seventy six, seventy seven, I guess seventy eight, and uh, that's uh, going to be an interesting, you know, um, by then he will be some of his lies and his character will be. Uh, put on true display, but so a lot of his his um, uh, benefactors and people that support him, they ain't gonna be around. They're gonna be off this planet. Agreed. And Remember. they will be replaced with younger people who are going to pull toward a a more unified society without the barriers of the understanding of of uh, color and race separates us humans, you know, rather than bring us together. I think another huge factor is is that on November 20th, I think it is, 20th or 21st, Joe Biden will be 78. So if he stays in term the whole time, God blesses him to serve his four years, he's going to be 82 years old when it's time to run again for the next election. 
what, what's going to what's going to be the fallout from that? I can't see an 82 year old man uh, running for president. So what happens then? Is it Kamala, which it seems like that would be the natural pecking order, or um, is it something else is going to happen? And how does that affect uh, the the progressive Democratic side of the ledger moving forward? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a whole new group of uh, of people on both sides. I think um, um, I think Kamala Harris is uh, going to be a factor, but I think she um, it, it's her it's hers to win or it's hers to lose, um, depending on how she she uh, acts and and some of the decisions that she makes. But I think it's going to be a whole new new span. And, and 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 I would like to see African Americans withdraw from the De- Democratic Party and the Republican Party and start their own party, and and leverage their votes according to what best suits and needs that we have. Um, you know, I don't care who's the president as long as what what their policies are benefiting me and my ch- mine. Okay, so that leads me into this last point, and we're running out of time. We got four minutes, so. Um, here's the next big thing that's going to happen. January 5th is the runoff election for the two Senate seats in Georgia. Yes. Currently, currently the Senate sits at 50 Republicans, 46 Democrats, and two independents, which the independents usually side with the Democrats. So it's 50-48. Those two seats in Georgia are going to be key into allowing uh, Biden and Harris to be able to get their administrative their, their, their policies and procedures across. I, Darren Miller, is going to be working heavily through the month of December. And anybody who's listening who wants to help me with this to get Ossoff and uh, Pastor War- uh, Warnock. No, that's the wrong name. I can't think what his name is now. Um, that's it. It's, it's not Warnock. It's, um, it's close to that. Anyway, to work on getting them elected to the to to the Senate, and so um, I'm going to figure out, make some contacts, figure out how we can do calling. Um, those of you who have money, I would ask you to give money to those individual candidates. If not, the Georgia Democratic Party. But we have got we in California are living high on the hog right now, and I think that we need to make sure that we are participatory in the national scope. Um, to make sure that we get those uh, work as hard as we can to get those two uh, Democratic people into the Senate because Joe Biden, with all the stuff that we've done, the 60% vote that we gave him in California won't mean a hill of beans unless he's able to count on the the Senate um, to be able to support what he's doing legislatively. And one thing that you, in your civics lesson there that you left out is that if it's 50-50, Kamala Harris will be the tiebreaker. Correct. And so, as the vice president, she actually runs the Senate, so they'll be able to to get a lot of stuff done um, right. without the obstructionists of uh, Colonel Turtle and uh, Tutti Frutti. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, you know that that's a good good place to be. I also read uh, Sean King's book. I think it's Make the Change or Be the Change. He has a new book out. Um, I'm, I'm going to go buy it for you and, and give it to you. You need to, you need to, you know, on your current give path, a, you need to shuffle don't buy, through. Don't waste your money on buying a book. Get a, a get a podcast or a subscription so I can listen to it. Because uh, reading ain't my thing. I have to do it. I have to read. I know, but reading for pleasure ain't my thing. So I've heard Okay, well, well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy you a book and I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to hide a $10 bill in it. Toward the end, so you're gonna have to read to find to find the ten dollar bill. Yeah, I got I got a technique for that too. I know how to flip through pages. Hey, 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 hey! It's, it'll be yours. You can burn it. You can tear the papers out, the pages out, and wipe your butt with it. I don't care. That my library. It'll be, yours, it'll be yours to do whatever you want with it. My library is impressive, but I can't tell you that I didn't read all of them. Okay, yeah, dude, I didn't read I didn't read my first book from cover to cover until I was twenty. <laughs> Four, 25 years old. And what was the book? Uh, Having Our Say. Huh? Having Our Say. It was a a memoir of two uh, African-American sisters, blood sisters, that grew up 
through they weren't slaves, but their grand their parents were born into slavery. They grew up in the South and migrated to Harlem. Uh, so they were part of the Renaissance and Depression and all that kind of stuff. Two teachers. I think they were both teachers. Sally and, uh, I'm sorry, Sadie and, uh, I forget their names. But it was two African-American sisters. Never got married, any other type of thing. And both of them lived to be right, right at 100 years old. And it's called Did you read the autobiography of Malcolm X? Uh, yeah. I read most, I, I haven't read a cover to cover, but I read most of it. So, yeah, so Having Our Save was the first book I ever read. So anyway, we're up against it. Uh, so it's 9 o'clock. Um, we appreciate uh, everybody tuning in and listening to uh, the Miller Boys and what we got to say. What's your parting shots? You didn't change your, you didn't change your background, what, four times now, three times? Yeah, that's correct. You know why? Because mm -hmm. I'm awesome. Okay. I like the first one though for the night anyway. Where the brothers at? With the crosses. Where the brothers with the crosses? Yeah. Yeah, they went to sleep. Oh, okay. They went to What's sleep. your parting words, man? Get out of here. Uh my parting words is uh we're moving into Christmas or moving into the holidays. Be careful, be uh be safe and sane. You know, uh, uh Trump's favorite scientist, Dr. Fauci, tells y'all to to maybe you might want to skip Thanksgiving. Or do it virtually. You know, think about what you're doing before you do it. Because COVID is real. You can ask some of your civic leaders uh, how it feels. Don't feel too well. Don't feel too good. Hopefully they, uh, um, no, nah, I ain't even going to say that. But uh, I was going to say pull through. But, you know, hey, we, we'll see how, 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 how they atone for their sins. And, and all the screwed up stuff. That, ooh, it's hard to not cuss screwed up stuff that they've done over the past and, and see how they are treated. Um, but, you know, as in always, love, peace, and hair grease. And uh, if you need it, use it. You might, you might have to put some of that grease on your knees and elbows, but, you know, hey, it's all love. It's all love. Stay happy, stay smiling. Keep a smile on your face. And always, um, God willing, we will be back. Oh, first of all, um, update on the parents. Dad is still dad. He's doing his thing. We're hoping to get mom home this weekend. Uh, she's doing better. Uh, her, her surgery was successful. Uh, we got some other things we got to deal with. Uh, so keep them, keep Harry and Bessie in your prayers. Uh, but they're both doing fine. They're both doing well with us. And hopefully they'll be re reunited, if not this weekend, um, in the very, very, very near future. Um, so with that, um, God willing, we'll see everybody back here next Wednesday. We're in touch with the Miller Boys um, at 8 o'clock next Wednesday. What's the date on that? I don't know. What's the date? Uh, 11 plus 7, 18. Very 11, good. 18. Very See good. you there. 11, 18. Peace. Yes. And it's 11, 11, uh, something, 22 today. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to plan up your day and, and wish for things and, and follow through. Great day for that.